Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming. Um, again, welcome to our home. Uh, before I begin our, my lecture tonight on my thoughts, um, it seems we have a very uh, diverse audience, people that are on different levels, different ideas. Um, and what I'd like to mention before I begin, just to give some background, that the stories in the Torah that we talk about are there both to entertain us, but also to instruct us on how to live a better and more godly life. Now, even though the characters in the Torah are really superstars, we still need to know they are human. And they still, and from their lives and how they're, and their experiences, it can teach us many lessons in life, and this is why we study their stories. So tonight, the theme, the topic will be a two-series uh, discussion, uh, a tale of two women. This is a story about uh, Sarah and Hagar, very important and something that also has some meaning even today. So these are two women who became matriarchs of their religions. Both were married to Abraham, Abram. Their lives were interwined. And that relationship would have far-reaching consequences for their descendants until today. Now, since these women play such an important role in history, let us see what we know about them. Sarah was not only Abram's wife, she was also his niece. We as a nation have been bred. Initially, we married within the family to imbue within our DNA the traits that make us so uniquely Jewish. This practice of marrying within the family only existed until the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. After that, close family marriages were Torahically prohibited. The monarchs of Europe married among themselves and it resulted in both physical and mental abnormalities. The wisdom of God Almighty to know exactly how long incestuous relations would be beneficial to the makeup of the Jewish nation. Sarah was also known by the name of Yiska. Now, Rashi says that she was called that because she was able to look into the future with holy inspiration. Again, she was a prophetess. In addition, it alluded to the fact that everyone looked at her beauty. When the Torah induces her, all that is mentioned is her name. Whereas with her sister Milka, the whole family tree is mentioned in Noach 11.29. She was a personage Sarah on her own, and she did not need to associate her name with anyone else. In fact, even her father, Haran, received his notoriety by being her father. Hagar was not a common maidservant. The Torah in the portion of Lech Lecha, 12.10, tells us that when Avram Avinu, Abraham, came to the land of Canaan, there was a, a devastating famine in the land. And both he and Sarah were forced to go down to Egypt for food. When they came, Sarah was abducted into the harem of Paro, the king. God punished Paro and his whole household until she was released. Rashi and Lechlecha 16.1 tells us that Hagar was the, was the daughter of Paro. She was a princess. And when he saw the miracles that God had brought for Sarah, he said to her, it is better that my daughter be a handmaiden in the house of Avram than a princess in another house. And so she became a maidservant to Sarah. Now Sarah was barren. She could not have children. And so it says, and so she says to Avram in Lechlecha, 16.2, God has kept me from having children. Take my handmaiden so that I may be built up through her. This seemed to be a custom of people at the time. Uh, a form of adoption. And even though Sarah gives Hagar to Avram to bear a child, and this is important, she does not free Hagar. This fact, again, since any child born to Hagar would not be a free individual, but a slave, the property of Sarah. Now this connects to the laws of a Hebrew slave. When a master buys a Jewish slave, the man can only serve for a maximum of six years. And then the master has to set him free. During his servitude, his master can give him a non-Jewish slave woman as a wife to bear him children. The children born from this relationship are not called the Jewish slave's offspring. They are called slaves and are the property of the master. When the Jewish slave is freed, the children that he has fathered stay and, and are the property of the master. So Yishmael was, in reality, 
sort of slave and not Avram's son. Now, once Hagar is given to Avram for procreation, she no longer sees herself as a maidservant. She now sees herself as an equal to Sarah, her mistress. This feeling is only increased by the fact that she conceives from the first act of intercourse, something that made her feel not only equal, but even superior to Sarah. Her, concep her conception showed Hagar that it, that it was Sarah that was infertile, not Avram. Hagar felt that if Sarah was really that righteous, you know, God would have allowed her to bear a child a long, go, a long time ago. So therefore, she did not look at her mistress with the same awe as she had done at first. Also, if you do the math, Hagar would have been a teenager when all of this happened. <laughs> not the most logical period in a person's life. In the best of scenarios. It's interesting then in that three out of four of the mothers of Israel were barren. Why? And Rashi tells us, God loves the prayers of the righteous. Now, you know, we're referring here to three of the most elevated women in all of Jewish history. What do righteous people do? They constantly pray to God. So really, what's Rashi telling us? A great lesson in life. It makes no difference who you are. When you really need or want something from God, your prayers are deeper and much more sincere. Now, Sarah complained to Avram about Hagar's attitude and lack of respect. He tells her in verse 10, 6, to do what is good in your eyes. Hagar was pregnant at the time with her first pregnancy. Sarah was so incensed by her lack of respect that she gave Hagar the iron raw the evil eye, and she miscarried. The verse in 67 states that Sarah dealt harshly with her and she fled from her presence. You know, there are different opinions about Sarah's treatment of Hagar. Rabbi Yisrael Yaakov Tushetsky suggests that Sarah's attitude really never changed. What changed was Hagar's perception of Sarah. When Hagar first comes to Sarah's house, she saw her as her mentor, she found all of her demands sweet and even easy. She saw Sarah as her spiritual guide, leading her down a road of revelation and purity. However, that changed. Once she married Avram and conceived, she now questioned the sincerity and purity of Sarah's motives. They were no longer light in her eyes. Somehow, now they changed. They seemed harsh. In reality, Sarah never changed. What did change was Hagar's perception of her position in relation to Sarah. This is one reason why it's so important, critical, that we maintain our teacher-student relationship with our mentors so that they can continue to inspire us and help us to grow in our service of God. Losing a mentor can negatively affect one's spiritual growth. You know, the tour states that both Sarah and Avram were guilty of a sin in regards to Hagar. Sarah's sin was for oppressing Hagar, and Avram's sin was for not interceding in their conflict. So how do we understand that? They tell a story of the holy Baal Shem Tov. It's called, the Baal Shem Tov loses a Shabbat, which may give us some idea of what we're talking about here. The Baal Shem Tov was a great mystic. There are many stories of him traveling with his Hasidim, with his students, and his trusted Gentile wagon driver, Alexei. They would usually leave on a Saturday night right after Shabbat. Alexei would let go of the reins and the Hasidim would hear the cloppity clop of the horse's hooves on the cobblestone street. And then the rise lids would become heavy and they would hear nothing. When they would wake, they would find themselves in some strange place, many times hundreds of miles away. Then the adventure would begin. And then they were never disappointed. The powers of the Rebbe, the Holy Baal Shem Tov, was truly miraculous. It happened at one time that they left on a Thursday with only two other Hasidim. They found themselves lost in a deep woods. It was so dark that it was hard to tell if it was day or night. The Holy Baal Shem Tov, who always connected to heaven, so to speak, a GPS, godly positioning satellite, now felt as if he had lost all of his spiritual powers. Shabbat was fast approaching and they didn't know what to do. The horses plodded on 
And then they saw light in the clearing. They now had some hope. As they approached the door, it was, they saw a mezuzah, and their hearts were uplifted. They knocked on the door, and a large, coarse-looking man, barefoot, and dressed in ragged clothes, answered the door. Well, they asked him if they could spend Shabbat with them. He refused. He told them that he despised religious people like them. They asked if there was any else else that they could stay for the Shabbat. He said yes, but it was many hours away. So after much begging and a great deal of money, he finally agreed to let them stay for the Shabbat, but on three conditions. He said to them, you pray silently. I don't want you scaring away my non-Jewish clientele. Come here for drinks. I don't want you, I, after you pray, come quickly to the table. I don't like waiting for my food, and I don't want to hear any discussions about my kashras. Either eat the food or don't. I don't want you talking about it. So they had no choice, but so they agreed. They asked if there was a stream nearby where they could wash and go to the mikvah, ritual air bath. <laughs> he began to scream and began threatening to throw them out. It took quite a while before they calmed him down. There was virtually no furniture in the hut. His table consisted of a stump with planks of wood resting on it. There were four more stumps that served as chairs that were around the table. He seemed to be making no preparations for the Shabbat. But finally, he took out a dirty burlap and spread it over the table. He then took a handful of mud, placed it in the center of the table, stuck a candle in the middle, and then lit the candle. They weren't even sure if he said a blessing or not. He then had them pray, and it seemed that he was finished, <laughs> even before he had started. He yelled at them and cursed at them to finish their prayers. Then he made kiddush on a large mug of vodka, and he said that they could answer amen or not, and he left only a few drops in the bottom of the mug for them, no more. Everything that they did, everything, was torture. He served them a lentil soup and gave each one a spoon, <laughs> no bowl. He leaned over and began slopping the soup all over and dripping it on his beard back into the pot. They tried to liven their spirits with song and began to sing it again. They were greeted with curses and insults. Well, you can imagine they were relieved when the meal was over. When they prepared to go to sleep and then gave them rags made out of wool and linen, shotness a forbidden mixture by the Torah. And so they refused, and they just slept on the hard floor. If they thought the day would be any better the next day, they were sorely mistaken. He woke them up early and rushed them through their morning prayers as he sang the hymns of a peasant song. They were, there was barely enough time to say half the words, and meditating was impossible. The day was filled with one torture after another. You know, they looked at the holy Baal Shem Tov for hope, but he was lost. Somehow he had lost his connection to heaven, and there seemed to be nothing that he could do to alleviate, alleviate the situation. Now that night was no better than the night before. They hoped that in the morning, the peasant would show them the way out of the forest. To their dismay, <laughs> the next morning they prepared to leave, and he gruffly said to them, this is how you thank me? I prepared breakfast, and you're running off? Well, they offered to pay for the little food that he had made, and they tried to leave, but he barred the door and made them stay for another three days of hell. Finally, on the fourth day, he cleaned them out of all their money and most of their meager possessions, and he agreed to show them the way out of the forest. And just as they were about to leave, the door opened, and there stood a well-dressed, sophisticated-looking woman. They were dumbfounded. She approached the holy Baal Shem Tov and asked him, Rebbe, please do us the honor of staying with us for one more Shabbat. <laughs> one more Shabbat. The Baal Shem Tov looked at her and said, Rebbe? Rebbe, how do you know that I'm a Rebbe? And if you know that I'm a Rebbe, why did you allow us to suffer as we have? Why couldn't you save us? So the woman looked at him and asked the holy Baal Shem Tov, don't you recognize me? He said, I don't think so. I don't think I've ever seen you before. 
She said, try to remember. You know, I used to work for you as a maid in your house many years ago. Your wife took me in. Seeing that I was an orphan, she tried to take care of me. I'd been forced to live on the streets for some time, and I was full of sores and lice. Your wife would wash my hair every Friday, and then she would comb it. When she did, she hurt me terribly, and I cried out in pain. She got upset when I did that, and she slapped me. You, Rebbe, were sitting there, and you did nothing about my pain or my shame. It was then decided in heaven that you had violated the commandment, do not afflict the widow or the orphan. The heavenly court sentenced you to forfeit your portion in the world to come because of this event. Well, many years later, I married this man who, by the way, is one of the Lama Dvav. He is one of the 36 hidden Sadiqim, who are the pillars of the world. It bothered us greatly, and we resolved to do something that would correct the situation. So through our prayers, it was granted that instead of losing your portion in the world to come, you would lose one Shabbat, the day which is a veritable taste of the world to come. Call me Ein Olam Haba. The question remained, though, who would carry out such a sentence? Where in the world would there be a person willing to totally destroy his Shabbat for you? So we accepted this task upon ourselves. The good news is that now your portion in the world to come has been totally restored. As she finished her explanation, the Baal Shem Tov felt a surge of his former powers return. He could not clearly see that all that she had told him was true. And with that, the Baal Shem Tov and his three followers gladly accepted the woman's invitation. They remained there for a second Shabbat when there was a deep and moving exchange of mystical Jewish insights with the great secrets of Torah from this hidden tzaddik who had sacrificed his own Shabbat so that they could attain the Holy Baal Shem Tov, his eternity. So too with Hagar, Sarah abuses her. She complains to Avram. He does nothing. And so then she cries out to God. God listens. God tells her in Vayera 21.18 that I will make him, her son, Yishmael, into a great nation. And due to Sarah's oppression of Hagar, God has allowed her descendants to kill and oppress Jews and the Jewish state until this very day, the long hand of time. You know, we always need to remember that nothing is forgotten. Time and space only exist in this world. God is not limited to time and space. So events that may seem to be totally disconnected to us due to their timing, to God may connect and be very relevant. Next week we'll continue and finish off the, the story between them and ex understand better what it is that we see on a deeper meaning when we look into the words of the Torah. And with that, may we help to herald in the coming of Mashiach quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. God bless you and look forward to more classes. Be happy, be healthy, and have a great Shabbat. Thank you.